get started. Hello, Dr. Slavin. Welcome back. Thank you. Everyone's looking great. <laughs> Love technology, isn't it wonderful? So far, I think it's been running fairly smooth. So we're, I'm pretty happy with what we've been seeing so far. So I, I'll throw out a couple of these questions. Um, let's see. First one says, I have pain in the back of my head around where the decompression was uh, 11 inches long. I get shooting pain out of my ears. Do the occipital nerves affect the ears? They may. They may. And it, uh, in, it's the individual anatomy varies from person to person. So some occipital nerve distribution may catch the back portion of the ear. And, uh, and we find this variability rather unpredictable. So usually the nerve blocks will help to understand if the numbness in the area of the ear um, is associated with pain control and also whether it's a lesser or greater occipital nerve is responsible for that distribution. So we try not to make blanket statements in situations like this, but the, uh, but the idea that the, uh, the occipital coverage may get to the ear or even in front of the ear uh, is definitely a valid notion. Is there a working non-invasive way to alleviate occipital nerve pain other than pain pills? Um, once again, varies from person to person. The, um, there was one actually one of the questions in that lineup about TENS, which is non-invasive way to stimulate the nerves. There is some literature that that may be an option for some patients, but, um, but in some others it actually may not work, but that does not mean that they may not respond to invasive stimulation or the medications. So I try to use algorithmic approach, uh, starting from less invasive to more invasive approaches. And uh, in if medications don't work, then we uh, go on to the surgical or interventional treatment. So, uh, so the, I guess the real answer to that particular question, then yes, it is a possibility. Uh, but once again, it has to be decided individually. Excellent. Um, several Chiari patients also have Eilers Daniels syndrome, EDS. Um, have you treated any who have also have this? Does their hypermobility and poor collagen pose further problems? Let Dr. Iskandar answer this first and I'll, I'll try to chime in as well. Uh, the answer is yes, Eric, but I have to say that this is one of the most disappointing. Um, patient population to treat in terms of response to treatment, especially surgical treatment. We've tried decompressions, we've tried uh, fusions, and it uh, the, the results are, are pretty poor. We, there's something we don't understand about it, that ligamentous laxity uh, and, and the pain associated with it is not just typical CSF flow mechanisms, which is what what we uh, really attribute the uh, Chiari pathophysiology to. So I don't know, Constantine, if you have. Uh... Well, I, I must say that you're absolutely right. And it's, uh, it does come up often in discussion of Chiari uh, population because ehlers um has many different facets of presentation and collagen deficiency may contribute to uh, either aggravation or exacerbation of Chiari symptoms. I'm not aware of any direct correlation between EDS and Chiari, but but I know it happens and people can have both or one of them. And uh, and I think what Oskandar implied too is that the surgery may be challenging in many ways with stretchable collagen. The patients may have uh, comorbidities, so they have one condition and the other. And the, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the increased mobility may interfere with physical therapy and rehabilitation. Um, so I, I know this comes up often and I remember we had multiple discussions with our colleagues about uh, whether or not something on genetic level may predispose people to have both conditions or the combination thereof. Um, and maybe one of the future topics for discussion in this forum will be related to that. Thank you. Uh, there's one here that says, um, in Dr. Oral's presentation, he spoke about the heartbeat with each heartbeat, CSF is produced, uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Does the body make more CSF when it's got more activity when working out or whatnot? 
can either you it, it, what, once again the fascinating questions you know we we don't really think about this that way the uh, the choroid plexus that makes spinal fluid um depends on circulation so if there's no blood flow there's no production of spinal fluid but the, the it's not directly heartbeat responsible for production of fluid it's more of the special mechanism within the choroid plexus that makes the fluid to circulate but the heartbeat has to do a lot with circulation of fluid so once the fluid is made every heartbeat and every respiration moves spinal fluid within the brain cavity and within the spinal canal and and the way the spinal fluid moves it gets strongly affected in patients with tethered cord with syringomyelia with chiari malformation so physical activity we strongly encourage that but in some patients physical activity makes them worse and that's one of the indications to intervene because we want people to move the last thing we want to do is to say oh if you get worse stop moving we don't want that to happen so if you feel like physical activity make the person the patient more symptomatic that's a good indication to intervene because intervention may eliminate that that link so after intervention it may be easier for a person to exercise or be active or be more functional and I think that's 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 a nice um, uh, rationale for intervention. Yeah, I agree with this. What I will add uh, for clarity is that with every heartbeat, CSF is driven down from the brain to the spine and then back up, so systole, diastole. Now, in a patient who doesn't have a Chiari malformation, they're open pathways. You know, this is how, this is one of the ways that the, that compliance within the, the the brain and the spine is maintained. That if you you know if you run fast, uh, you know the fluid and the brain structures are all compliant, and and you can roll with the with the flow if you want. However, if you have an obstruction anywhere along this pathway, but especially at the craniocervical junction, then when you start to want to drive more fluid down, uh, then then that doesn't happen. And this is when you start to have a dissociation in the pressure between the brain and the spine. And this is where Chiari patients become symptomatic. So this is why we see that with Chiari, a lot of Chiari patients, uh, the symptoms come with straining, with activity, with uh, you know, neck movement, uh, all of that uh, amplifies it. But it's all based on normal CSF pulsations related to cardiac pulsations but an abnormal channel for that CSF to go through. Thank you. Any recent developments or research that you're, or clinical trials that you're aware of for diffuse arachno, arachnoiditis? This actually came up on our table discussion before the lecture started. And, uh, and I was, yeah, our uh, attendees that I, I'm not aware of that. I would want be interested to see if my colleagues have any uh, in no notion of, of the ongoing research. But what I do see is that there's research happening with long lasting effects of arachnoiditis, be that neuropathic pain or syringomyelia. But the arachnoiditis mm -hmm. itself is, is, is very elusive condition. It happens for many different reasons and can come up with many different clinical presentations. It can be very disabling. And, uh, and the, as far as I know, I, I'm not aware of any ongoing research, but I'd be interested to see what my colleagues think about that. So the, uh, Dr. Earl, thanks for joining us. Um, the question was, are, are you aware of any research clinical trials on um, arachnoiditis? Uh, related to Chiari malformation? Hello? Yes. Not specifically. Yeah, the, uh, the question just is for, here. Okay. There certainly is um, in terms of syringomyelia and arachnoiditis causing syrinx in the spinal canal. Um, but arachnoiditis uh, <clears throat> in a series of Chiari patients, I'm not aware of a study of that. So the next question is, can removal of the tonsils help? <laughs> um, by removal, it's Anyone usually, want to on? by removal, it's usually a, a shrinkage procedure. Uh, you want to be judicious in the approach. Um, external reduction um, can certainly help. 
Uh, it's not unusual in a more severe Chiari for the tonsils to be wrapped around the brain stem. And just a dorsal decompression or a decompression from behind may not relieve that compression. So a judicious, careful microscopic reduction of the uh, neural tissue at the tip of the tonsils. The tonsils uh, were studied uh, years ago pathologically, and a lot of those neurons are already disorganized. We've certainly taken pictures of blisters in the tonsils, of calluses at the tips from chronic uh, compression. So a lot of that tissue is affected. Now, if your decompression by itself gives you the room you need, then you don't shrink the tonsils. But I've shown in other meetings, and I'll describe right now, where full dorsal opening of the dura down to C2 with tonsils that are markedly herniated. And those tonsils just fill up the space and they say, fine, you know, I'm not going to relax here. So uh, those can be judicially, judiciously reduced and put a nice patch in. And that I've noticed I've not seen any neurologic um, effects. On the other hand, if you go higher in the tonsils, you can start getting into, into transient eye function issues. Uh, and frankly, recollecting, I think I've seen a couple of those in my experience. Uh, but fortunately, over a few months, they did improve. I, I would add to that, uh, Eric, that uh, this was the topic of the uh, ASAP-funded uh, multi-center trial that that we just published this past year. Um, what the uh, when we surveyed the ASAP community years ago, uh, Tim George and Marcy Spear uh, and I and, and others, uh, we found that the number one question on everybody's mind is, what about the tonsils? What surgery is best? And what we found in our study, and this is a pilot trial, it's not hundreds and hundreds of patients, we, you know, that become a very expensive trial, uh, is that there is really no identifiable difference. Uh, and that uh, if we wanted to, you know, what, what the trial has achieved is two things. First, at first glance, there is no real difference to uh, coagulating the tonsils versus not. Uh, and and it it really um, you know the evidence to that is that so many uh, pediatric neurosurgeons do this and half of them reduce the tonsils and half of them don't and the results seem equivalent um, and the second uh, part of the paper that I think in my opinion was more important is we de determined what statistical power. Uh, is needed for a study like this to answer the question definitively. And uh, and so we came up, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it was like uh, almost a little less than 300 patients would, would need to be uh, accrued in order to answer the question definitively. The only last thing I would say is that we have to be careful when we, uh, com when we compare adults and pediatric patients because the, the, there are significant physiological differences between them. Uh, there is a lot of growth taking care of in children, uh, growth of their spinal column, uh, you know, it, the, the changes in the conformation of their brain. In fact, we know that the tonsils lift up over time uh, as, as one ages. So it may be a completely different scenario when you compare adults and pediatric uh, patients. And then... Uh, I, yeah. And then just to follow up on that, I, I certainly don't treat children, haven't in over 15 years, so I uh, certainly defer yeah. to Dr. Iskandar. One of the problems nationally and probably internationally is the high degree of failure of Chiari surgery. I've yeah. evaluated probably two to 300, I would think. I know I've surgically treated um, over 100 patients and putting this work together that have had previous Chiari surgeries. But uh, some of these have had multiple surgeries trying to fix the issues with the first surgery. The most surgeries uh, a lady had referred to me from an academic center nationally I had had seven altogether, not all in the back of the head, the shunts, the infections, et cetera. So, um, and I agree, you don't want to shrink the tonsils in adults if you don't have to. I wouldn't want my tonsils shrunk if I didn't have 
to either. On the other hand, failure is a real difficult issue to take care of. And our job is to create adequate space in that area. And I think it's, it's simply case-based. It's the more serious herniations. So, but I agree, there's no trial in, in the adult population in severe herniation of what's best. This is really important, John. Sorry, Constantin. I'll just add one quick thing. Uh, failure, uh, you know, I've looked at my series of failures, and just like uh, there is failure of uh, lack of uh, complete decompression, uh, the, a lot of the failures that I've seen, in fact, probably the majority, are patients who come in after the tonsils have been reduced and now have significant arachnoiditis. Uh, and I think you and I have discussed this before because we're both, we've kind of both seen this phenomenon. Uh, the more stuff you do in the spinal canal uh, after you open the dura and arachnoid, the more likely you're going to have scarring in the future. So we have to be very careful. When we don't have the data, yeah. we have to be very careful. Get the best decompression you can and try as much as you can not to damage. And I'll be brief. I totally agree. And, yeah. uh, Decompression has to be dorsal, not medial if you can, maybe internal. You cannot leave um, tissue that's likely to adhere. And if when you were talking about arachnoiditis, you're talking about these adhesions that we certainly see and have to work through. I totally agree that does occur. Yeah. Just me, uh, just a little bit of kind of a historic thing, because when I was in training, I remember reading original papers of Gardner, who recommended not only removing tonsils, but plugging the apex, going into the fourth ventricle, because he was concerned about uh, formation of syringomyelia as a result of Chiari. And and this has evolved. And over the years, I think what, what you just heard from my colleagues is that what happened. We, we rarely, if ever, touch tonsils. We don't even teach residents that tonsils need to be addressed. As long as you have adequate decompression, and you can put a patch, and there's plenty of room and fluid circulating around tonsils, you can live them along. But having said all I this, agree. I had patients with secondary mm -hmm. chiari with, where patients just herniated and all tonsils were ischemic and swollen and they really needed to be removed. And for those patients, you know, they, uh, it was more of a life-saving issue than not a quality of life. So there sure. are situations when tonsils need to be not just shrunken, but literally taken out just to save the, from compression. In majority well, we, of chiari patients, that's not the case. You know, the, usually the, the tonsils deformed, they herniate down, they're misplaced. But with adequate decompression, just like Dr. Oro and Dr. Skandar mentioned, you can create enough room around them and you can avoid extra manipulation, avoid coagulation, avoid bleeding, which eventually translates into more inflammation and scar. And therefore, ideally, you want to be as little invasive as possible while getting the maximum results. So there are obviously are situations when you need to intervene and do something in terms of reduction of volume or mass. But in majority of patients, it's, it's usually not needed. And the final answer will come if we all do outcome studies and follow a large series of patients. We, as you know, have published and created one outcome scale. Hopefully there'll be others. And I think that's the, actually the next stage in, in, in our area is uh, all of us agree upon how we measure outcomes and start doing one-year, multi-year outcomes. And then we can definitively answer these questions. Correct. And I think the evidentiary base will be important because what, what Dr. Iskandar mentioned in terms of study, showing that there is different ways to, more than one way to skin the cat and having the same outcome, mm -hmm. then you start wondering about the other part of outcome, meaning the complications, the longevity of effect, the the, the duration of hospital stay, the chance of mm -hmm. aseptic meningitis or spinal fluid leak and all other things which do affect the long-term outcome. So it's not just MRI appearance or afterwards. It's not just, you know, the disappearance of headaches. There's many facets to outcomes. And I think having prospective studies, particularly comparative ones, or even blinded if possible, which is difficult, but doable. So all of these things will, will add. And I think that's, that's why it's important to have the ASAP and similar organization to sponsor the studies because somebody has to do this. And there's so much information missing and we will never know unless we create this evidentiary base. Excellent, wonderful conversation. So uh, right along that same theme, a uh, couple questions. Um, one is, uh, what are your thoughts on Chiari Zero 
And then will tonsils ever come back once the decompression is done? Would that be the same as brain slumping? Three well, huge questions. Brains. You know, each yeah. of them he has yeah. its own conference. <laughs> yeah. And they're too complex for me, so please go ahead. The tonsils won't come back uh, as such. Uh, brain slumping is due to over decompression. It's one of the eight uh, factors in failure that we've identified. Uh, it's just too big of a decompression and the uh, cerebellum doesn't have adequate support. Um, so we have the largest experience in reconstructing the subocciput with a titanium plate. Uh, not that, I'll, that's primarily to reapproximate the tension band in the back of the head that, that seems to be ignored in this, uh, in this, uh, in this problem. So anyway, as far as um, slumping, that's simply over decompression, in my view, anyway. I can address the issue of the Chiari Zero, partly because I was part of the team that initially described it. Um, this is uh, a, an issue that ha has taken a, a life of its own. Just like anything, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you start seeing observations, all of a sudden, everything around you look looks like that. So the, the, the initial observation was that if you have syringomyelia with no identifiable cause, which means there's no Chiari, there's no tethered cord, there's no tumor, there's no arachnoiditis, there's no history of trauma, and the, and the syrinx is big and symptomatic. In some patients, if you do a posterior fossa decompression, the syrinx will go away. And you know the initial series was five patients. Uh, in my, I've been here 20 some years. I've only operated on six or seven, uh, eight maybe Chiari zero patients. So it's very rare. The problem, uh, there are two problems. One, it's very, it's impossible preoperatively to separate the syrinxes that are related to a Chiari pathophysiology, i.e. Chiari zero and the syrinxes that are completely idiopathic where there's no cause that's identifiable. It's impossible to do it preoperatively, which means the diagnosis of Chiari zero is really a postoperative diagnosis. The ones that respond are Chiari zero, the ones that don't are not. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to make those decisions. But the second and more important one is all of a sudden, uh, things started to appear in the, in the literature and in people's, uh, uh, you know, uh, among physicians that you don't have to have a syrinx, that if you come in and you have a normal MRI and you have Chiari-like headaches, then you can do a posterior fossa decompression and that's Chiari zero. And, and that is very dangerous territory because there are so many things that can cause posterior headaches and neck pain and Valsalva induced uh, uh, symptoms. So this, in my opinion, is not under Chiari Zero. Chiari Zero is a very tiny specific set of circumstances that I believe is real. Uh, I mean, I've seen it work, uh, but it's, it's rare. Well, I just support that. It is rare. It's fascinating. One of the, well, the largest syrinx that I've seen in terms of width and length uh, was in a 31-year-old uh, woman. And uh, I show this slide at various conferences. You can only get two millimeters of uh, herniation out of her scan. But I guess it's just the right two millimeters. Yeah. Um, her three-month follow-up showed only minimal reduction but her hands had improved significantly. She didn't want anything else done. And by a year, she had reduced maybe about 50%. So, I mean, but I agree, those are rare. Uh, we have to be very cautious about that disorder. Yep. Should we, as Chiari syringomyelia EDS patients, should we be concerned about COVID-19? <laughs> yes, yeah, the short answer is yes. Just like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But but just keep in mind the uh, the pe the people who contract COVID nineteen um, uh, suffer from two more more than two, but definitely two separate issues. One is respiratory insufficiency, and one is immune response related uh, uh, disease that concerns the rest of the body organs. And respiratory insufficiency may be exacerbated by pre existing problems, including 
problems with respiratory drive due to brainstem dysfunction, or the problems with diaphragm diaphragmatic movement from upper cervical cord dysfunction. <clears throat> Patients with Chiari and syringomyelia, by definition, are expected to have some of these issues, maybe not clinically relevant, but they may become more noticeable or exacerbated by ongoing secondary problems. So COVID-19 is uh, one of those conditions which may be completely asymptomatic, or it can create a rather major and life-threatening situation. So I think you should be concerned, and uh, I don't think you should panic and stop living because of this, but using standard precautions, including the mask, stop touching your face, wash your hands, use social distancing, is that's what I recommend my patients. Uh, can bipolar disorder be caused by Chiari? <clears throat> I guess that depends on how much you interact with different doctors and how conflicting statements you get from them, but I don't think so. <laughs> I don't either. Okay. Um, who would place the ONS? Would that be a neurosurgeon, a pain management specialist? Who would that be? It can be both, can be either. The, um, in my practice, I've been doing it myself. I'm a neurosurgeon. Majority of ONS devices in the country are placed by pain specialists, but not every pain specialist will feel comfortable doing this. Those who are dedicate themselves to neuromodulation and put different stimulators, spinal cord stimulation, peripheral nerve stimulation, are usually comfortable doing occipital nerve stimulation. But I can tell you that based on literature and our analysis of data, the experience tends to correlate with the rate of complications. So people who do it often and do it um, uh, routinely, they tend to have much better outcomes in terms of decreased rate of complications. Um, otherwise, the, uh, there is no particular guideline that it must be a surgeon or must be a pain specialist. Pretty much anybody who is dedicated and uh, experienced in this should be able to do this because realistically, it's very straightforward intervention. But if the doctor who you're seeing for this never done one, um, I mean, he'll have to learn somewhere, but, but, but you don't want to be the one he's learning on. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> somebody puts in a question that says, I have almost every common symptom of Chiari and occipital neurology, as well as cranial cervical instability. My sublime MRI did not show Chiari. Should I have an upright MRI to check that? <clears throat> so, she does have craniocervical instability, or she has all the or symptoms. suspected all the symptoms. No evidence of Chiari would an uh, upright MRI help. <clears throat> well, I mean, the best um, scan to measure the craniocervical junction motion is an upright MRI scan. And there are defined, Dr. Fraser Henderson defined the uh, measurements quite uh, tightly and helpfully, if you will. So, yes, if we're suspicious that there might be associated cranial cervical instability, you sure, certainly don't want to do a Chiari operation in the presence of Chiari with that condition as well. So they do get, uh, we only have one scan, upright <clears throat> scanner in Denver, but fortunately they do a good job. And then we measure the CC angle, the cranial cervical angle, and the grab oaks measure, and uh, make some judgments. I also, in cases that are suspected, I have them sit in a chair, walk around behind them, place my hands on their head, and tell them I'm, I'm going to be gentle. I'm just going to lift your head up. So uh, manual traction test on the head. You're lifting up on the head. And many people won't notice any difference between lifting and letting them go. But a few people spontaneously will tell you, oh, can you just do that? And then you let them go, you let the head, you release your hands, and then there's this settling feeling and they sense it. So if that, that's just a little clinical test, but the key measurement is the, uh, the um, CC angle and grab oaks. Uh, Frazier, uh, Dr. Henderson has published his first 20 cases. This is a very demanding procedure uh, I think there are only a few people in the country that are focused on it, especially in Chiari patients. Um, and I have done a few of these CC fusions myself, uh, but eventually just defer to, uh, to others. Again, extensive procedure. On the other hand, I, can, I have seen patients that it has helped. 
So clearly there are some patients that have associated CC instability uh, and carry decompression it's by, <clears throat> by itself might make them uh, worse instead of better. Excuse me. <clears throat> oh, that, those, those are great questions. And you know, my general point on this is that, uh, first of all, try to um, minimize the, the self-diagnosing. You know, it, it's in my practice, you know, when people come and they diagnose themselves with conditions, it, it's, it, it can be correct, but it rarely is. So the, um, there's some tendency among humans, including myself, to, to come up with some weird assumptions based on what I hear or what I feel. And, and so I, I'm a big supporter of objective evaluations and evaluations by a third party, you know, not, somebody, not your family member, not yourself, but somebody who actually knows what he or she is doing. And I would definitely trust Dr. Oro when he does this, but when the patient comes and says, and I went to this chiropractor and they pulled my head and I felt better, that doesn't really have much of diagnostic significance, particularly for major decision makings in my practice. So, so I kind of caution my patients about, you know, over reading into their own symptoms and coming up with long list of possible diagnosis doesn't mean that they are not, don't have a problem. They do have a problem, but I just don't think that the, uh, uh, Self-diagnosing is just a good way to, to proceed with medical treatments. Now, having said all this, I'm a I'm big supporter of correlating clinical picture with, with objective findings or with imaging. So if you do see something and it matches the patient's presentation, then it makes sense. But just to come up with test after test, trying to find that yet something else that will support something that you don't really see and you have not seen over and over again, it's, 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 it's just a torture. So, so I think that they, to, to, to go back to this, you know, there, there's school of thought that, you know, everybody has to be fused at cranial cervical level just because of this. And I think it's wrong. I mean, just like there's no one solution that will fit everybody. So there are definitely patients with cranial cervical instability. Some have Chiari symptoms, some do not. Some present with pure pain, which is, you know, sign of instability. But those are relatively few. And uh, most mm -hmm. patients who come with headaches probably don't have any serious solid surgical indications. So I would caution them against overdoing this because you know it's, it probably will not help. And second, they're gonna have complications which will be hard to undo or impossible just because there was just no indication to intervention in the first place. So um, I, I kind of, I, I empathize with people who have unsolved issues, but I caution them against coming up with 10 possible explanations and trying to treat them all aggressively because most likely most of this in, you know, observations are wrong. Maybe this is a good point to interject on. Uh, I agree with everything you were saying. Um, every now and then um, families will ask you, what do you recommend doctor in terms of Chiari surgery? I never recommend Chiari surgery. That's not my job. My job is to explain uh, what they have to detail the surgery as best as possible, including illustrations in the scan, to answer their questions. I ask them not to make the decision while they're in the office, to go home and think about it. They're the ones that have to decide if indeed from the clinician's point of view, it's indicated by a broad group of symptoms and clear diagnostic studies uh, again, uh, we need to empower folks. Uh, this is a partnership. I, I would like to interject as well. I, I definitely agree with what Dr. Slavin was was saying, and 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 of course, Dr. Oro always has uh, very useful things to add to these. Um, one thing I'd like to look at it from a different direction. There are only about thirty symptoms in neurology that we, we, we know of. I mean, I've counted them. I couldn't count more than 30. <laughs> but there are hundreds of diseases. So when someone comes in and says, well, I have an occipital headache and I have some neck pain and I have these, and when you pull my neck, this happens, that could be, you know, as little as 30 different diseases that could be causing this. It's very easy for us because we are in the Chiari community and because we, you know, it depends on who we talk to daily and we, who we happen across to start making diagnoses based on symptoms that are very nonspecific. So that's the, that's the danger of 
of patients self-diagnosing, which is what Dr. Slavin is saying. That's the importance of having specialists who tell you, no, look, you don't have a Chiari malformation. You have these symptoms, and these could be coming from tension headaches. These could be coming from those other symptoms, and uh, and the you know th that's that's where the discussion starts. Yeah, I total totally agree. And again, it has to be based on solid radiographic evidence. But the other key aspect is there are so many associated disorders that could be masking and looking like Chiari malformation. So we have to look for um, brain swelling from pseudotumor cerebri. Uh, there's, there's just a long list of, uh, of conditions. We do blood work, uh, inflammatory studies, uh, vitamin D and other studies. Uh, those can affect neurological function. So um, there's a wellness nurse that is uh, extracting their social situation, if you will. What's the tension in the family? Uh, what's the nutrition? What's the sleep? Uh, you mean their son uh, stays up till 4 a.m. most of the night uh, and uh, wakes up at noon and has a Chiari malformation. Well, we are not going to fix that whole situation by, by decompression. So the social and general health aspects, I think, are crucial. And, and, and I agree, you, you can't operate on a list of symptoms. Um, on the other hand, if they're if there are symptoms that fit the radiology and the other associated conditions, which are long in nature, I mean, CSF hypotension, we haven't mentioned that yet. Um, then yes, fortunately in our study over a decade ago, we showed a 84% significant improvement in the quality of life uh, using the sickness impact profile. It was the first study using a quality of outcome measure. I don't think yet we have an outcome measure that looks at the symptoms and the radiology before and after surgery that we could use as a community to see, are we making the right judgments or not? Um, and I hope the, the younger, uh, and all of us here still, uh, but the younger crew coming up will, will move us forward um, and guide us in answering some of these questions. Excellent. Um, <clears throat> Why does the weather have such an effect on our pain? You know, there are some studies that uh, apparently in the joints might even change the pressure a little bit. Uh, I have uh, patients that um, will tell me they feel better when they come from the high mountains uh, down in altitude. On the other hand, I've had uh, folks from say Florida feel better when they go when they go up in altitude. So I myself don't have a real good handle on that uh, issue. Body response to environment. So there, there's no question there's some connection there, but, uh, but I don't think there's any direct link and there's direct easy explanation for that. But I remember in the past, people would come and talk about sunstorms and magnetic uh, uh, changes and the pressure changes, you know, Pressure, people can feel about storm coming just by increased pain in their joints. So that's, there's definitely mm -hmm. atmospheric pressure that has effect on that. But, you know, in Chiari in particular, in syringomyelia, we talk about pressure gradients and we talk about, you know, changes in uh, everything that has to do with physical constants. And uh, therefore, it's not surprising there's connection. But I am yet to discover the exact mechanism for this. <clears throat> um, have you seen symptoms return shortly after decompression surgery? If not, uh, and if, were there more problems that showed up after decompression? That will be a great topic for separate conversation and entire conference on this. <laughs> you know, the, uh, why symptoms improve, why they don't, why they recur. And, uh, and I think Dr. Ora would well cover that already, discussing the, uh, the cases when he sees for patients coming after uh, previous operations, and there are plenty of reasons why things can come back or never go away. Inadequate decompression, too big or too small, the wrong indications to begin with, compounding conditions, be that <clears throat> idiopathic intracranial hypertension, collagen disease, tethered cord, there are many possible reasons. There's placebo effect, there's psychological issues, that uh, there is a stress associated with surgery. All of these are contributing to either improvement or worsening. 
So uh, this, this is, there's no easy answer for that. But uh, we do see patients who have just complications of surgery, who present with different symptoms, sometimes similar to what they had before. We see patients whom surgery uh, created new problems because of you know worsening of instability or damage to the occipital nerves or the uh, spinal fluid leaks and pseudomeningus seals. So the list is long. And, and I can tell you that's actively being discussed in surgical community about ways to minimize it and how to prevent certain things from happening. But uh, this is not un, uh, unusual. It's uncommon. Majority of patients do remarkably well. The symptoms go away and do not come back. But it, it does happen, and I don't think surgeons or patients should be surprised when this happens. They should be prepared for this. And my suggestion is to, to go deeper and try to find out what happened and why symptoms either didn't go away or came back soon. So we're, we're coming up on the end of our, our time, but I want to ask um, a couple last quick questions. Um, is there a connection between mast cell activation, mastitosis? and tethered cord? And then what about microchondrial disorders? T tell me again, between mast cell and tethered cord? Between, between, yes, between mast cell activation and tethered no, cord. I'm not aware of any associations. There could be some, but I'm not aware of them. I, I couldn't think of why, what a pathophysiology would look like, why they would be related. And then is there a genetic testing that can be done for tethered cord? No. Uh, this is, um, you know, knowing that tethered spinal cord is a heterogeneous set of malformations, um, uh, it's often not hereditary. Uh, and so it's unlikely mm -hmm. that you're going to have a genetic test that would show it at any point. Thank you. Um, let's, uh, one last question, Dr. Oral. You mentioned uh, central sleep apnea and normal sleep study. Would one expect any episodes of central sleep apnea, or would this indicate that the Chiari is impacting the patient? Um, let me see if I understood the question. If there's a clear Chiari, you know, these stretches, these compressions of the brain stem that I've shown, uh, and central sleep apnea, you certainly can't rule out the possibility that they're related. Uh, on the other hand, I suspect there are a lot more people that have central sleep apnea that it's not due to a Chiari compression. Um, so um, I guess the final thought is that, um, you know, there's a stretch, there's a compression. We haven't talked about Cine uh, uh, MRI and um, also intraoperative ultrasound. Um, we can see an intraoperative ultrasound once we've removed the bone in these severe cases. We can see a pistoning, we can see uh, a compression, a distortion. This has not yet been characterized that I know of in a lot of videos, but that's work that could be done. So Chiari is an active um, disease. I didn't show a slide. I maybe I should have. Uh, this is a 54-year-old um, attorney who was diagnosed with Chiari. Her, her scan looks to be about six centimeters or so. She's so busy and self-employed that for 10 years she puts up with it. She um, gets another scan, marked distortion, increased herniation, development of a syrinx. Fortunately, she improved after decompression. So that progression of the Chiari happened um, during that phase of her life, if you will. Uh, we don't know how many of the uh, folks progress, but again, this pistoning, this expansion of the brain, this herniation, this stretching. And fortunately, uh, as I showed in that young woman, uh, at least in some patients, we've documented that a lot of that can, can settle down. And so, um, although we have to be very cautious in um, the diagnosis of these symptoms could be due to so many things. We do have modern radiology that shows us that uh, we, um, there is a, a problem. And then we do have the early outcome studies that show that we can change their quality of life. I still occasionally will get a 15 or 20 year letter from a patient and their quality of life is dramatically different. Um, 
anyway, more to come with the next generation. I guess I'm aging myself or dating myself, but more to come. Um, and, you know, I'll just say ASAP has been there from the get go. And, um, and we're all learning this new technology. And I think uh, hopefully we'll just continue to grow. Wonderful. Thank you, doctors, uh, for your contribution this morning. We have a whole ton of different questions out there. What we'll do is we'll, <clears throat> we'll print those out and we'll send them and hopefully we can get some uh, offline answers to some of these other questions and then we'll, we'll put them up for people to review. And say let's take a break now. For we don't want to answer everything for them. So, you know, <laughs> let them work a little bit. Exactly. They're, they're good guys. So. <laughs> we'll move them on to the next step. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll take a break. Um, we've got a, we're going to play at uh, 1255 uh, Eastern time. We'll play a video and then our next speaker, Dr. Vez will come on at one o'clock or a little bit after just a couple minutes after one o'clock. Thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the break. Take a break. Go get something to eat and then we'll resume at 1255.